All right, would you please stand as I read our text this morning? I'll be reading Acts chapter 1, verses 12 through 26. <clears throat> then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120 and said, Brothers, the scriptures had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man bought a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language, Echeldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it and let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, you, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. This is God's word. You may be seated. Well, last week, we looked at the very uh, opening verses to the book of Acts, and we saw how Luke, the doctor, uh, told us about Jesus' final interaction with his apostles before he ascended back to heaven to be with the Father. We saw that Jesus had offered many proofs to his disciples to demonstrate that he, in fact, was risen from the dead, and that he also gave his apostles uh, some final instructions. They were to wait. How many of you guys love waiting? We love waiting? No, they were to wait, and they were to wait for the Holy Spirit, which the Father would send to them. And upon receiving the Holy Spirit, they would be his witnesses, witnesses of Christ in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And as Jesus was taken back into heaven, they were given the promise that this Jesus, born, crucified, uh, raised, and ascended, that he would in fact return. We saw that we do not know the times, we do not know the dates, we do not know the specifics, we just know that he will return. And, and, and the disciples, the apostles, are left with the sense that you're not supposed to expect Jesus to appear anytime soon, like he had appeared to them after his resurrection. There's a finality to the ascension of Jesus, and this was the time for the apostles to get busy. And we talked about there was work to do, and, and that's where our text picks up today. They're left with this question, okay, now what? He came, he suffered, he died, he rose, he offered many proofs. He told us to wait for the Holy Spirit that was going to come. He has ascended. What do we do now? And Luke describes which the church, what the church did in those very early days, why they were waiting for the Spirit to be sent. So there's three things that we're going to look at. And uh, I'll just say up front, these things are very basic these things are very fundamental, these things are very ordinary, and these things are very important, okay? They are very, very important. They are this, prayer, okay, if you're a note taker, prayer, study, and preparation. Prayer, study, and preparation. Let's begin with prayer. 
uh, it was not uncommon for the early church. What I mean by that is in the first century, it was not uncommon for the early church to find itself in unexpected and uncertain situations. Uh, in just a couple chapters, we're going to witness some incredible things in the book of Acts. We're going to see Peter stand up. He's going to preach a gospel. Thousands of people are going to come to faith in Christ, which is a huge blessing. And we're going to see it also presented the church with a challenge. Now that it has grown, there's all these people. What do we do with all the widows? How do we feed all the people who are a part of this family? That's a challenge that they are going to face. You're also going to see that the apostles are going to be brought before the magistrate. They're going to be threatened. They're going to be beat up. They're going to be ordered not to preach the gospel. They're actually going to get thrown into prison. And there are countless challenges that the early church uh, needed to navigate challenges. Remember, they had never faced anything like this before. This was all new to them, and they're facing these challenges. They need to navigate these challenges with both uh, boldness and with wisdom. And in fact, we'll see as they navigate the challenges, they exhibit both, boldness and wisdom. I think that um, this, the, the last year has, has put us in a position in which we are better able to appreciate some of what the early church was dealing with. We have had to navigate things we never thought we would have to navigate. We had to answer questions we never thought would be asked. We've had to face things we never thought we would have to face. Some of you have, have suffered in different ways, to different extents, but it has been difficult uh, for you. Some of you have suffered in unique ways. There's been times where you just scratch your head and go, really? Is this happening? It feels like things are falling apart. It seems like things are uncertain. We kind of get into this mode where we're just kind of waiting for the next shoe to drop, the next announcement, the next statement from a leader when we face these uncertain times, when we face things that are utterly new and unprecedented for us, what do we do? What can we do? Well, we can ask, what did the early church do when they faced trials? What did they do in Acts chapter 1? Look at verse 14. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer. This is something that occurs again and again and again in the book of Acts. When the church faced difficulty and opposition and persecution and challenges, whenever that happened, Luke is going to tell us that the church committed themselves or devoted themselves to prayer. They responded to challenges with prayer. When things got rough, when things got difficult, the church prayed. We need this simple, powerful reminder right now. Not just because things have gotten difficult, not just because right now things are difficult, but because I think the future is going to be more difficult. Things are not trending towards a better uh, cultural setting for the church. Things are trending towards more difficulty. It is our tendency, it is our human tendency, our natural tendency, the tendency of our, of our flesh, that when things do get difficult, we tend to either um, lash out or check out. When it gets difficult, we tend to lash out or check out. I know I can speak for all of the pastors here and many, many other pastors that I know, both locally and around the country, that this has been the most difficult thing about the last year. It's not necessarily the government. It's not necessarily mandates and restrictions and all of that. It has been the lashing out and the checking out that we have seen among God's people. The issue here, please hear me, is not a difference of opinion. The problem is not that people have different opinions on what's happening. Happening. Please understand this right now. There are very, 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 very smart, educated people who very much disagree on things. That is not the problem. 
The problem is when that disagreement becomes an issue of character. Because you disagree with me, you're stupid. You're, you're an idiot. You, you whatever, fill in the blank. That, friends, is the problem. There is all sorts of room to disagree on things. There is no room to tear each other apart. This last year, we uh, pastors, we've gotten all sorts of uh, nasty emails and messages and have been called things online. We've had to walk through um, really, really painful, difficult times watching people check out, scratching our heads and going, this makes no sense to us. People that we've called friend, people that we have called brother have checked out. This chapter, this text is a, is a challenge to us and, and maybe a rebuke to us that invites us to, rather than lashing out at one another and rather than checking out, consider what is happening in this text. The church cried out. The church came together in prayer. They were united in prayer. They brought their worries. They brought their burdens. They brought their cares. They brought all of it, their questions, they brought it before God in prayer. Sometimes we overcomplicate things. Sometimes we take something that's simple and we make it really, really unnecessarily difficult. When you think of prayer, okay, some of you may have this thing in you that says, prayer is scary, <laughs> Or, or prayer is for people who have been Christians a long time. Prayer is for people who know big words and know how to make you know, beautiful statements. Prayers have to be formally structured and be impressive and have all these complicated terms. Friends, that is not true. Jesus is not impressed by big words. He's not impressed by long prayers. He's not impressed by any of that. You don't need fancy words. Do you know that you can just talk to God? Do you know that? You can just talk to God. You don't have to have all the words. You don't have to have all the ideas. You don't have to have everything. You can just talk to God about whatever is on your heart. Every Christian can pray, and every Christian ought to pray. It doesn't matter where you're at. Sometimes prayer you know, if you're like me, sometimes I'm laying in my bed and I'm praying to God, but I'm not talking out loud. It's just kind of, it's in here. I'm talking with God in my mind. Sometimes maybe you, you go for a walk and you're talking to God. You can talk to God wherever you're at, wherever you're at, whenever. Sometimes talking to God is something that happens verbally. It's, it's external. You might go for a walk. You might have a, 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 a quiet moment and you pray to God. Sometimes, you know, David when you read the Psalms, you get the notion that David's not thinking in his head and he's not talking calmly, that he is crying out and shouting. You can yell. Have you ever had to yell in a prayer? Have you ever just screamed out? Have you ever done that? No? Okay, I have. I've gotten in the car and went for a drive and screamed for 10 minutes till my throat was raw. You can do that. You can pray. You can talk to God. You know what happens when God's people choose to pray and not lash out and not check out, look at verse 14. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer. One accord. There is a unity that comes from prayer. There have been times in our church recently, we do this seasonally, where we ask the whole church, will you pray and fast on Thursdays? And some of you do that all the time. It's become a regular habit, but there's certain seasons that we will ask the church to do this. When that happens, there is a unity that is cultivated in the body. We see on social media people praying for the church today. We'll hear people, hey, I've been praying for you. We'll get a text message, hey, I just want you to know I'm praying for you and your family. We're praying for the church. We're thankful. There is a unity that is cultivated in the church by prayer. So we need to be a people of prayer. The unity that comes from prayer is incredibly important if we are to face the challenging times that are before us. Jesus left and promised the Spirit. The disciples, the apostles, they're there wondering what to do. What do they do? They pray. 
they pray. Second, study. I told you this was basic and fundamental. Study. Right out of the gate, the apostles are faced with this question, okay? There's a challenge that they have to figure out. Christ had appointed 12 apostles. I don't have time to get into why that's so important. Just know there were 12 tribes. There's 12 apostles. There's continuity here between Old Testament and New Testament. But Jesus appoints 12 apostles. Now we know Luke tells us, perhaps in a clinical way that a doctor would tell us, that Judas not only died, but he hung himself and his guts fell out, right? He, 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 had, he, had, he had taken his own life. And so we no longer have 12 apostles. Now, what are they going to do? What, is, what are the apostles supposed to do? What's the early church supposed to do? Well, what they do is they open their Bibles. They're like, hey, we lost one. What should we do now? Let's open the Bible and see what it says. They looked in the Bible. And Acts tells us, this text actually gives us insight to what the apostles believed about the Bible. In verse 16, it says, Brothers, the scriptures had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those uh, who arrested Jesus. Now, there's some fascinating things in this one verse that we learn about the Scriptures. First of all, the Scriptures are inspired by the Holy Spirit. Notice, the Scripture had to be filled which the Holy Spirit spoke. So the Scriptures, what we call the Bible, this thing right here is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Sometimes this will be referred to as divine inspiration. This notion of the Spirit being, or the, the Scriptures being inspired by the Spirit is consistent throughout all of the Scriptures, and it's the very thing that the Apostle Paul and Peter, who's making the statement, actually says in a later letter called 2 Peter. So look at 2 Timothy real quick, chapter 3. It says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent and equipped for every good. What is the all scriptures that Paul is talking about in this text? What is it? It's the Old Testament. That's what he is referring to. All scriptures, right, is breathed out by God, inspired by God, and he says it's all profitable. All of it is profitable. Church, is Genesis profitable? Is Exodus profitable? Is Numbers profitable? Is Leviticus profitable? Is Deuteronomy profitable? Are you sure? It's all profitable. And it all is useful in the life of a Christian. Second Peter, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by what? The Holy Spirit. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. No scripture was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The reason that we stand on Sunday as we gather and we read our text is not because this is man's ideas or man's thoughts or man's notions about God. Rather, the Bible is God's word to man about Christ. If you want to know what the Bible is, it's God's word to man about Jesus. This is why we and Christians throughout history have believed in what is called um, inerrancy. That means that in our Bible, there are how many errors? Zero, right? Right? There are as many errors in the Bible as there are Super Bowl wins for the Browns. Zero. None of them. We believe in inerrancy. We also believe in the doctrine of infallibility, meaning not only does the Bible not have errors, it is impossible for the Bible to have an error in it. Why? Because God is light, 
and in him is no darkness. When God speaks, he tells the truth all the time. It is impossible for God to lie because God is truth. And so we have this inspired by the Holy Spirit, the inerrant, infallible word of God to us about Jesus. There is nothing in the world like your Bible. There's nothing in the world like your Bible, written by over 40 human authors, varying from kings to philosophers to people that we would consider blue-collar construction workers, written over a period of about 1,500 years, three different languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic, translated into over 3,000 different languages today. All of it, every word, every letter, every chapter, every book, inspired by the Holy Spirit and profitable to you, profitable to you and to me. When we read the Bible, friends, we are hearing the voice of God. When we read the Bible, we are hearing the voice of God. This is why when the apostles were faced with this challenge, what do we do with the death of Judas? They did not consult a growth management firm. They did not consult a PR expert. They did not find and do research on best practices for churches in their community. What did they do? They opened their Bible. They opened their Bible and expected God to direct them and give them wisdom. Friends, that's what we must do. If we are asking questions, open this thing first. Don't open your browser. Open this thing, right? This thing will speak to you. And specifically, get this, they look to the Psalms. What's being quoted here is from the Psalms. Do you know that the most quoted Old Testament book in the New Testament is the Psalms? That the New Testament authors, they love the Psalms. They're always talking about the Psalms. They opened up the Psalms. Think about this. What should we do? Where should we look? Let's look to the book of Psalms. And when they opened the Psalms, they not only expected God to speak them because they knew that they were inspired of the Holy Spirit, they were not only committed to obeying what the Psalms said, but they think about the Psalms in a very unique way, a way that we need to learn to think about the Psalms. Again, look at verse 16. Brothers, the Scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. Now, this single verse will transform the way you think about your Bible. This verse is so chock full of truth, it will change everything. Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas. What was David talking about in the Psalms? The apostles tell us Christ, the life of Christ, even the betrayal and the arrest of Judas. What's David talking about the Psalms? He's talking about Jesus. The apostles read the Psalms and they read the Bible this way because they had been trained to read the Bible this way. Jesus himself had trained them to read it like this. In Luke chapter 24, Jesus runs into some of his disciples. He's risen. They're not expecting it. They don't notice him. And he's a little bit frustrated with them, okay? And he says this, beginning with Moses, okay? That is shorthand for the law, the book of the law. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, beginning with Moses and all of the prophets. So Jesus is talking about Moses, the prophets, the whole thing, the Psalms together. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning what? Himself. The books of Moses are about who? The Psalms are about who? The prophets are about who? The whole Bible is about who? Okay, Jesus also said this to some Bible experts. 
In John chapter 5, he rebuked them. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness to who? To me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. What does Jesus teach about the Old Testament? That it's some outdated, useless book? That that was for the Jews in Israel, but not for Christians in the, in the first century? That it has no significance for a New Testament believer? No, Jesus said this, the entire Old Testament from beginning to end is all about him. And this is how the apostles related to their Old Testament. They opened up Psalms and looked for Christ. They read it trusting this was the inspired word of God and they expected God to speak to them and to give them wisdom to navigate whatever it was they were dealing with. They expected to hear God's voice. Let me just ask a question real quick, okay? First of all, will somebody tell Brandon to turn the heat on because it's freezing in here? Is anybody freezing? Okay, it is freezing, okay? That's not in the text. First, here we go. Are you reading your Bible? Very simple question. Are you reading your Bible? Maybe you don't have a Bible. There's a ton of them on the back wall back there today. As you leave, pick up a Bible. Are you reading your Bible? We're reading all sorts of things these days, all sorts of reports, all sorts of blogs, all sorts of articles, all sorts of mandates, all sorts of guidelines, all sorts of, all sorts of, all sorts of everything. Friend, read your Bible. Pick up your Bible and read your Bible. Now, I know some of you are like, yeah, yep, I need to be reading my Bible. And there's some of you that feel really intimidated by that. Like, uh, it's a big book. Some of you have study versions of the Bible that are like three times thicker than this. And you look at that and go, there's no way. I can't even watch a, you know, a short episode on Netflix. I get distracted. How am I supposed to read this thing? You get intimidated by it. You go, you know, you, you, you maybe hear a friend who's got a Bible reading plan, and they're going to read the Bible in, your, in a year, and you go, that just seems like too much. That's crazy. Or you have like a super committed friend, and they're going to read the Bible in three months. You're like, there's no way I can do that. Okay, if that intimidates you, just throw those things out the window. Just read your Bible. My son, he went, uh, went to youth group. He came back. He's all, Pastor Russin said we should read the Bible. I'm like, yeah, sounds like a great idea. <laughs> Where should I start? It's like, oh, you, you know, you could start with Luke. We're, we're going through Acts. That might be helpful. Or, or you could start with John. Or maybe you could read the book of Acts. There's not really, you know, it's not really a bad place to start. But those would be some good places to start if you just wanted to start. But here's the point. Just start. Just start reading it. Don't be intimidated. Make, make a small attainable goal. Say, if you're not reading the Bible right now, make it a goal to read one chapter a week. Can you do that? One chapter a week. Start with that. Just one chapter a week. Take it slow. Maybe you want to start with the Psalms. Just read one Psalm a week. And if you start reading it and you go, I have no idea what's going on. This makes no sense to me. I'm so confused. Just know you're totally fine. You are totally fine. Because listen, it doesn't matter. We overthink things sometimes. If I asked you, what did you eat for dinner three weeks ago? Could any of you tell me, right? Do you remember what you ate for dinner three weeks ago? The answer is no. The, here's another question. Did it work? Did the, did, the, did the food sustain you? Did it nourish you? Did it provide the nutrition your body needs? Did it do that? Yeah. Do you understand how that worked? No. Do you remember it? No. Okay. Eat your Bible. <laughs> Just read it. If you don't understand, that's fine. God's power in your life is not limited by your ability to understand the Bible. Just read. Read a little bit. Just start. 
The last thing is preparation. It's easy, I think, to miss this. Um, everything that's happening in this point of the text is all about preparation. The reason that they're trying to figure out what to do with Judas is because they are preparing for what Jesus had promised them. They were going to be Jesus' witnesses in Jerusalem when the Spirit of God came upon them, and they're waiting, but they're actively waiting, right? They're not just sitting around twiddling their thumbs. They're praying. They're reading the Word. They're appointing a new leader, and all of this is in preparation for the moment when the Spirit of God will show up and will empower them. And understand this, none of them have any idea what that's going to look like. They have no idea what it's going to mean for the Spirit of God to come upon them and for them to proclaim the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. This, this, this had not happened yet. So they have no idea what's going to happen. They just know Jesus said it's going to happen, and so they had to prepare. Now notice what is required of Judas's replacement. Verses 21 through 22. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection, okay? So these are the credentials, the requirements for the person who is going to replace Judas. And I want to just, on this final point, identify what they're not looking for and what they are looking for. They're not looking for somebody with great leadership skills. That's not mentioned at all. Second, they're not looking for a charismatic speaker that kind of has a magnetic personality that just draws people to themselves. Third, they're not looking for a life coach. Fourth, they are not looking for a particular kind of leader that will help them connect with a particular segment of their culture. There's one thing that they're looking for. There's one requirement. This person was actually an eyewitness to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. That is the only thing that mattered. Why does that matter? It matters because of what the church is. It matters because of what the church is. We are not, we are not supposed to be a community of people that have good advice for everybody, although there is good advice in the Bible. We are not called to be PR managers for Jesus and make sure that there are no misunderstandings and that he is thought of positively by all around us. We are called to one thing, You know that that saying, you had one job, right? We're called to one thing, to testify to the historical truth regarding the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what we do. That's what we're called to do. That's what the church has been doing for the last 2,000 years. This is why Matthias had to be a personal eyewitness. They don't give a, a care about his leadership skills. They care that he was a witness to the resurrected Lord because that is the message. Christ crucified, buried, and raised. That is the message. It's the message the church tells over and over and over again. It's the message they will preach throughout the book of Acts over and over and over again. It is the story that we are telling today over and over and over again. The church is a one-trick pony. We are a broken record. We have one thing, Christ risen. That's what we say. And this movement in Acts, this moment is preparing to bear witness to the resurrected Lord. Let me ask you, are you prepared? Are you prepared to say, Christ died for your sins, he was buried, and he rose on the third day in victory over sin and death. Are you preparing for that? That's what we are to be preparing for. We are to prepare to be his 
witnesses and understand God will do this in different places, in different times. He will not ask you if you're ready. He will not consult you for your calendar, but God will show up and he will open up opportunities. He will put you in places to have conversations. And friends, we have to be ready not to give some complicated explanation, but simply to say Christ is Lord and he's risen. This week, I went to get my wife some coffee at the Coffee Oasis, and I'm minding my own business, and and God's like, no, you're going to have a conversation about the resurrection. So I get in this conversation with a young man who is flirting with the baristas, and, and he wants to talk about the resurrection, and he grew up in the South, and it was shoved down his throat, and he doesn't think Jesus actually rose from the dead. And so, so we went there, and we talked about it, and we talked about the resurrection. And I said, if I give you a book, would you read it? He said, yeah. I said, can I leave it with the baristas here? And Because I kind of get the idea that you come here on a regular basis. And, um, and he agreed. And okay, I wasn't looking for that. But God was on the move. Friends, we have to be prepared. So when those unexpected opportunities arise, we're ready to proclaim Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords, crucified and risen on the third day according to the scriptures. This morning, that is what we proclaim. If you do not know Christ this morning, you are invited to trust in him. There is forgiveness in his name. Jesus saves to the uttermost. Let's pray. Lord, we are both convicted and inspired as we think about this text in Acts. We ask that you would give us this deep unity in prayer, that you would make us a people of the word, a people who search your scriptures. Would you prepare us to testify to the simple truth of your death and resurrection And even now, Lord, we pray that you would be arranging moments for us this week to share that good news. Give us eyes to see the opportunities you put before us and give us boldness to speak the truth. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.